how I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain family with another track from their latest album belief for it and that's called hymn of heaven hymn of heaven good evening welcome back to the mount pleasant bible institute video podcast from monday june 10th 2024 i'm dr joseph speciali and this is our second hour of our bible study we're studying the gospel of matthew and we're in Matthew 13, if you want to go ahead and turn there. We're talking about the mystery parables of the kingdom of heaven. And we're, we left off on the parable of the mustard seed in Matthew 13 and verse number 32. <clears throat> and that's where we're going to be picking up our study here this evening. Matthew 13 and verse number 32. We'll begin reading in verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, 
and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. <clears throat> now last week we talked about how the mustard seed is extremely small. In all five appearances of the phrase mustard seed, it's called a grain. And it is a very small grain. It's not the smallest grain, or the smallest seed, I should say, in all the world. And we addressed that in what Jesus is saying here, as well as in Mark's account, where he specifically says it's the least of all seeds in the earth. He's not speaking in the absolute and definitive sense that uh, it is the smallest seed in all the world, in the earth, and, and so on. Um, and, of course, that leads people to say that Jesus is either mistaken, he's ignorant, he's a liar, uh, all of which are blasphemous accusations that uh, strip him of his deity. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ knew when he said this that the mustard seed wasn't the smallest seed in all the earth. But he's, he's calling the mustard seed, in Mark's account, the least of all seeds in the earth because of the audience he's speaking to. They're not aware, they have no idea about the existence of these other seeds. The poppy, for example, um, or the orchid seed. They don't know what those are. They don't use them, they don't plant them. So uh, what purpose would it serve for Jesus to say, you know, the mustard seed is the third or fourth smallest seed in all the earth? No, to, to the first century Jew who tills his field, plows his field, sows seed, has a garden, the mustard seed was the smallest of seeds that he knew of. And that's how Jesus is speaking here. That's the place he's coming from, okay? Uh, it's amazing. So if you want a little bit more information on it, you can go back to our study last week. We also talked about how quickly the mustard seed grows. You're looking at an image right now. Day one, it's a, a, like a grain of sand. But on day four, you've got all these greens popping up already. It's, it grows very swiftly, which, by the way, is not how any tree grows. Trees grow very, very slowly. Herbs grow relatively faster, and the mustard seed very fast, as you can tell by the example. So when the text says that it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree, becoming a tree denotes something went wrong. Something went contrary to design. Something went contrary to intent. Something went contrary to nature, to DNA, to genetics, because as we mentioned in our study of Genesis 1.11, when we shared with you the threefold division of plant life, grasses, herbs, and trees, it says very specifically there that they all produce after their own kind. Grasses don't produce trees, herbs don't produce grasses, and so on. They produce everything, as a matter of fact, all life, plant and animal life and human life, everything reproduces after his own kind. An herb is not a tree. The mustard seed's an herb. It can't, it can't become a tree. So there was genetic corruption here. Something went wrong. God didn't do this. This wasn't God's design. Somebody either mutated it or manipulated it, but something went awry, okay? So the image you see at the top shows what the normal growth of a mustard seed is going to produce. It's going to produce these yellow flowers, this herbaceous uh, plant here. At the bottom shows what it became in the parable, a tree. And that is against nature. Now, we mentioned the cross-references, okay? The parallel passages to the parable of the mustard seed, uh, both in Mark and in Luke. You have Mark 4, verse 30 through 32, 
and Luke 13, verse 18 through 19. In Mark and Luke's accounts, it's the kingdom of God that the mustard seed is a picture of. Here it's the kingdom of heaven. And it's far more easier, I suppose, to understand as we go through what all of this means, um, it's far more easy to see how this could apply to the kingdom of heaven, which is the outward, visible, earthly aspect of the kingdom in the absence of the king, versus the kingdom of God, which is what's spoken in Mark and Luke's accounts. The kingdom of God is the, is the inward, the invisible, the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Okay? But we're going to take a crack at this and try to explain this to you, what all this means. Obviously, the illustration here is growth. It's growth. It's spread and it's growth. That's, that's what's being spoken of here. We're keeping in mind that the mystery parables, both of the kingdom and heaven and kingdom of God, are speaking about the sphere of the kingdom in the absence of the king. So the king, which is Jesus, is not on the earth from his ascension to his second coming. So what is the conditions, what's the characteristic of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God during that period of time, which is probably 2,000 years right on the money, okay? What's the conditions? Well, we have this growth here, and but it's abnormal. It's not what God intended. It's grown into something. Now, the mustard seed is going to grow into something very beautiful, very large, okay? Okay, in its own right, naturally. But what's happened here in the parable in it becoming a tree, it's something far vaster, far more powerful. A tree is much firmer, stronger, and all of that than any type of plant, okay? But it's unnatural. It's absolutely unnatural. So what does this picture? Now, the Lord doesn't provide us an interpretation to this parable. We mentioned that last time. It's the first of five parables where no interpretation is given. Okay? But uh, one possible application is that I believe it refers to the origin and growth of the institutional church. What I mean by that the visible, the outward church, not the true body of Christ, because and here we have to make a distinction between the body of Christ and what you can call the institutional church or the local church. Because the body of Christ is a spiritual organism. The local church is an earthly institution. There is no local church in heaven. There's no local church in heaven, okay? There's the body of Christ that's in heaven, all right? That's the spiritual organism, the body and bride of Christ, all those who've been born again. But the local church is an institution. It's an earthly gathering of those who profess to be born again. And you take it a step further, they've also been baptized, immersed in water, and joined by way of covenant with fellow believers, professed believers, okay? But here's the catch. The Holy Spirit places the members in the body of Christ immediately upon their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. The Holy Spirit does that. He regenerates them and baptizes them into the body of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. The pastor, or as some other pastoral delegate, is going to be baptizing the church member into the membership of the local church. And here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is not going to make any mistakes as to whether somebody truly received Jesus as their Savior or not, because he's the one who regenerated them. So everyone who's in the spiritual organism, which is the body of Christ, they're all saved. 
but even the most spiritually discerning of pastors, church members, whatever, could easily miss one or many people who profess to be saved as being true Christians and admitting them into membership of their church, baptizing them, bringing them you know, into the church, and so on. In other words, they can say they're saved, they can have all the walk and all the talk of a true Christian and still not be born again, because we don't see the heart, folks. Only God does. And so, even in the best of situations, in, in the best and most discerning of churches, you have tares among the wheat, if we can go back to that parable. We have professing Christians who are truly lost mingled in with those who are truly saved. And I believe that's what you have here, only it's looking at the parable of the mustard seeds, looking at the whole of the 2,000 years between the ascension of Christ and his second coming. Or I guess we can say the rapture, because the rapture is going to create a separation between true believers and false believers, isn't it? Uh, all true believers are going to be taken to heaven, only false ones left behind. So you're talking about a period of about 2,000 years where you have this institution called the church, which God intended to be a, a microcosm, a microcosm of the body of Christ. He knew that the body of Christ couldn't worship in a single assembly. That's completely impractical and impossible. Okay? Can't do it. The body of Christ has people on the earth, but also people who've gone on to glory. You need an institutional church. Okay? You have the family of God in heaven, but you have earthly families too. The local church is an institution, but God meant for it to be just a local version of the spiritual body of Christ. In other words, the local church should only consist of truly born-again believers, okay? And while, again, that might be the case in most instances, it's not exclusive, and that's a problem. And then you start getting into situations where local churches begin to compromise their standards, their doctrine, and so forth, and over the course of time, you now get to a point in place where the Unbelievers, although they profess to be Christians, outnumber the true believers. And then in some instances, you have churches where the gospel isn't even preached at all. A false gospel or a social gospel is preached, and church is and that church is not at all what God intended. It's not even by definition of its doctrine and its practice a New Testament church anymore. It's a Laodicean church a social gospel, Jesus, a social gospel being preached, okay, and so on. So the local church started the way it's supposed to start. It started with, uh, you know, Jesus and his disciples. It grew to, uh, although they did have a, a false believer in their midst in Judas, didn't they, right from the get-go? Um but then you had 120 members there on the day of Pentecost. And then throughout the book of Acts, Acts 2, 41 and 47, you have 3,000 members being added to the church there on the day of Pentecost. Acts 4, 4, another 5,000 added. And then throughout the book of Acts, Acts 5, 14, Acts 6, 7, Acts 11, 21 and 24, Acts 16, 5, all those verses talk about church growth the church growing in numbers, souls being saved. And so you start with 120 members there in the very beginning, and it grows to tens of thousands, no doubt, hundreds of thousands. And we have no reason to believe these weren't true believers. But as it got larger and larger, something went wrong, and it grew into something unnatural. As the gospel spread throughout the world, and you start having millions that are genuinely saved, in spite of persecution against Christians, we might add, all throughout the Roman Empire, Christianity became uh, the favored underdog among the masses. I believe, personally, the pivot point was when the Roman Emperor Constantine was converted. And I use air quotes for the word converted there. 
When Constantine converted to Christianity in 312 AD, and his conversion was not one in which he heard the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus being preached, and he realized he was a lost sinner in need of a Savior, and bowed his heart and head to the Lord and asked him to forgive him for his sins and come into his heart and save him, and he trusted him as his personal Savior. That is not the salvation testimony of Emperor Constantine. His conversion to Christianity was, I saw a sign in the sky. And that sign said, In hoc signo vinces, in this sign conquer. And I made a deal with the God of the Christians that if he gave me victory over Maxentius at the battle of the Milvian Bridge, I will embrace the Christian God as my God. And as a token of his, of his, uh, uh, to show his intentions were genuine, Constantine put the sign of the cross that he professed to have seen in the sky on the shield of all of his soldiers. And that cross was in the form of, some say it was uh, uh, the Greek letter chi and rho mingled together, the chi rho symbol. Others say it was in the form of an Egyptian ankh. Okay? It was not the standard cross that we as Christians have today. Okay? Regardless, even if it was the standard and traditional cross, that's not salvation. That's not biblical salvation, folks. Okay? So I'm not going to sit here and stand in judgment of Constantine. Maybe at some point in his life he heard the true gospel of Christ, and before he actually expired and left this life for eternity, he truly did receive Christ as his Savior. I don't know. I hope he did. But he wasn't saved by virtue of the testimony he gave about what happened on the eve of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. That didn't save him, not by a long shot. But because the emperor then became a Christian and he issued the Edict of of Toleration at Milan in 313 AD, persecution was halted against Christians and it became in vogue. It became stylish. It became popular to become a Christian. Many of the pagan temples <clears throat> and, and, uh, and houses of worship became churches, and so on. We're not going to get into all of that history, but it's a pivot point, I believe, because now you have, I believe, a corruption, a true corruption taking place Because here and moving forward now, you have a whole new look and profession of what a Christian church is, as churches popped up everywhere. But these churches weren't churches like our Baptist forefathers, the Anabaptists, the Donatists, and all of them, those who were persecuted in days past. These churches had idols with names like Mary and Jesus on them and blessed St. Peter and all of that. There was clearly doctrines that were being taught that had no place in the Word of God. In fact, many of them contradicted sound teaching from Scripture. And yet they still called themselves Christian churches. And they flourished. They flourished. Okay? These actions led to millions throughout the Roman Empire converting, again, I put converting in quotes, air quotes, converting to Christianity without being born again. And so today, what most identify as the church and characterize the church to be is not anything near what the Lord intended. Is it a microcosm of the body of Christ, which only consists of born-again believers? Absolutely not. Is it an institution that teaches uh, only what the Bible teaches soundly? No. It holds to traditions uh, and oral, uh, oral laws that contradict the Word of God. It is not what Christ intended. And let's just face it, if we're being honest, most people in the world today, as well as for the past thousand plus years, what most people identify as the church is the Roman Catholic Church. 
and we can add, because we don't want to just implicate Rome, but similar churches, okay? Similar churches, and we're not saying that all Roman Catholics are lost and going to hell. We're not saying that. If a person's received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and their trust and faith is in him and him alone, none of their works, they're born again regardless of what church they go to. Now, we believe a born-again believer shouldn't be going to the Catholic Church, shouldn't be going to an Eastern Orthodox Church. They should be going to a fundamental, independent, Bible-believing church, okay? But if they've trusted Christ, they're born again, period, okay? So we want to make sure we're clear on this. We don't want to turn people off unnecessarily, okay? The truth is going to offend some people. Inevitably, it is. But I believe that what this parable of the mustard seed is showing us is what the Roman Catholic Church primarily, but not exclusively, has done to the institutional church over the past 2,000 years. It's become something Christ never intended. Never intended it. Using the Catholic Church as our example, again, it's not just Rome, but it is by far the largest, and it is by far the most guilty. There's no doubt about that. Okay? But the Roman Catholic Church has amassed unprecedented material wealth, as well as political power. What about saved souls? <clears throat> as one that was raised Roman Catholic in Chicago of no no less places. I remember getting saved and without even knowing any better, I remember that I gave my testimony to a nun that worked at the nursing home that my grandmother was in. This was in October of 1986, long in there, just shortly after I got saved. And I figured that, you know, because I, I just, I, I, my sins were forgiven. I was going to heaven. I had assurance of my salvation. It felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders with my sins being forgiven. And I thought, man, if anybody can relate to and rejoice in what has happened to me, it'll be sister, and I can't remember her name anymore. But I thought, you know, she's going to be thrilled. And I remember talking to my grandmother on the phone, and I asked to speak to that nun. And I shared with her what happened to me, that I had read in the Hal Lindsey book about the gospel of Jesus, how Jesus came and, and died for, for my sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and that in order for me to go to heaven, salvation was so simple that I had just simply put my faith and trust in Jesus. And I did that. I prayed a prayer asking him to forgive me and come into my heart. And based on God's word, he saved me. And I'm just, I feel like the weight of the world's been lifted off of me. And I kept waiting for her to rejoice with me. And what I heard on the other side was just silence. Stunned silence. I think the expression is crickets. And then finally she broke forth and said, My you sound inspired. I remember. And I thought, what a peculiar thing to say. How about, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. As any of us who are born-again believers would say today over somebody that we've we known and is coming forth and saying, I got saved. We would rejoice with them. This nun had no idea what I was talking about. She didn't have that born-again experience. How sad. How sad. So the Catholic Church has amassed material wealth, political power, no saved souls. Now, it doesn't mean that Catholics can't be saved. They certainly have been saved. There's people attending Catholic churches today who are truly born again. But they're not born again because of something their church preached. They got the gospel some other way. Okay? Now, the Lord may have used something 
from their church to get their attention. But we know we're saved one way and one way only, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And I can assure you that if a Catholic church is going to be faithful to what they're supposed to be teaching, there's not going to be a Catholic priest that's going to get up there and give the plan of salvation and invitation for people to receive Jesus and put their trust in him and him alone for salvation without any works. Not going to do that. Okay. All right. So um, how did the Catholic Church amass this wealth and power? I think the answer is given to us in the next parable, the parable of 11. So we'll talk about that next time. Um, but it's false doctrine, essentially, that has enabled her to amass that wealth and that power. I want to read you a quote from John Phillips' commentary. We've mentioned that before, and I'm going to quote it because I don't think it can be said any better than what Brother Phillips states in his commentary on Matthew here regarding the parable of the mustard seed. So I'm quoting now from that source. The parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven are a pair. The former deals with the outward development of error in the church. The latter deals with the secret and inward development of error. The Lord wanted to compare the kingdom to something in nature that defied the law of its being. But where could he find an animal or plant that so violated the code of its kind that it deliberately set out to be something its maker never intended? A tree has a massive trunk and great branches that keep subdividing into smaller and smaller branches until they dwindle into twigs. In other words, a tree is an impressive symbol of organization. It is an emblem of power that is derived from a central authority and through its various administrative arms reaches down to the lowly rank and file. Israel was a tree. The church is an herb. The visible church, though, has aspired to become a worldly, hierarchical system, a superpower established around a central authority that delegates its authority by organizational means. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is not what the Lord intended. It's not what he had in mind for his church. In Israel, the mustard plant grows to a height of 12 to 20 feet, which shows that even as a shrub, it is of princely growth. And although the church was never intended to set up a worldly empire, it certainly was intended to be something that would stand out. We mentioned that a while ago. A tree, however, soars far higher than a shrub. The mustard that became a tree was something foreign to what its creator intended, something to which it never could have aspired without some mysterious denial of its nature. That's the mystery of the parable. The application is that the church, which should have remained true to the humble teachings of the Savior, has become something he never intended. It has become an imperial power in the world. It has grown and developed into a vast organized system of religion. The Roman church is by no means the only fulfillment of this prophecy, but it is the supreme example. So let Rome be our illustration. The Roman church is, to borrow a phrase, the ghost of the Roman Empire, its continuation in history. The ecclesiastical structure of that church is an extension of Roman imperial administration in the West. To that we say amen. What pagan Rome was, papal Rome became and is. The Church of Rome is the kind of religious system the Lord foresaw in this parable of the mustard seed. He saw a church that had become a worldly kingdom. That's John Phillips from his commentary on Matthew. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right, so the mustard seed became a tree. It became a tree, and again, the pivot point, I believe, is the conversion of Constantine and really the formation of what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church. So that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Um, I believe we mentioned this last time, 
how this expression is used in Ezekiel 17, 23 in regard to Christ and his kingdom. It's also mentioned in Ezekiel 31, verse 6, in reference to the Assyrian and his kingdom. The Assyrian is another name for the Antichrist, prophetically, there in Ezekiel 31, verse 6. This expression of the birds of the air coming and lodging in the branches is also an expression used to describe Nebuchadnezzar in his kingdom. We see a lot of, uh, of similar things in our various studies on Mondays and Tuesdays, aren't we? We've seen um, Genesis touched upon in Matthew. Now we see Daniel touched upon in Matthew and vice versa. And so uh, we're in Daniel 4. And Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom is depicted by uh, in that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had as a great tree and the birds of the air lodge in the branches thereof. Daniel 4, verses 12 and 21. So what do the fowl of the air represent? Well, we don't have to go very far to get the first piece of that one. Going back to the parable of the seed and the sower, in verses 4 and 19, the fowls of the air represent the wicked one. That's identified as Satan in Mark, Mark's account, Mark 4, verse 4 and 15, who's the devil in Luke's account, Luke 8, verses 5 and 12. Unclean birds symbolize or represent unclean spirits, according to Revelation 18 and verse number 2, if we can go there. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit, so devils are foul spirits, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Devils are represented by every unclean bird. So speaking of unclean birds and habitations, Isaiah 34, verse 10 through 11 and verse 15 give the depiction of Edom under divine judgment. And the imagery here, the picture, is of it becoming a lake of fire at the second coming of Jesus. And it says in Isaiah 34, 10, It shall not be quenched, night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. What's dwelling there? Listen to the list of animals. They include unclean birds. Verse 11, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. Those are carnivorous waterfowl. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion, the stones of emptiness. Verse 15 mentions the great owl and the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Those are all unclean birds. Unclean birds settling in a place where the fire is not quenched night or day. The smoke goes up forever and ever. It's a picture of hell, folks. In Revelation 18, we just read, Babylon the Great is judged by fire. And even though it's on fire and the smoke of Babylon ascends up forever and ever, it's become a habitation of devils. Why is this given? because the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. It's their eternal abode. Now, why do we point that all out? Because unclean spirits are represented by birds. By birds. So the fowl of the air, here in uh, verse 32, that are lodging in the branches of this tree first and foremost, represent unclean spirits. Now think of it. If this mustard tree is the institutional church, then branches would be denominations, um, branches of the church, chapters of the church, um, synods. Uh, what else would it be called? Um, um, or just individual local churches, okay? Diocese, whatever you want to call it. That's what the branches represent. And what we're seeing pictured here is that these churches are filled 
with unclean spirits. Supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No mention of him. No mention of a dove. Now, if a dove was part of this, maybe we can make a case the Holy Spirit's present. But birds of the air represents unclean spirits. Now, and I believe that's what it represents as well when it talks about the fowls of the air making their nests in the bows of the tree that's the Assyrian in Ezekiel 31.6. The one world church and the global government that's going to be set up by the Antichrist and Babylon the Great and the tribulation is going to be filled with devils. Okay. But then in Ezekiel 17.23, when it's talking about Christ and the Messianic kingdom, it says, In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it. And it shall bring forth bows and bear fruit and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing, and the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. Here the fowl doesn't represent unclean spirits, because Satan and all unclean spirits are going to be in the bottomless pit during the millennial reign of Christ. So the fowl here doesn't represent unclean spirits, but men. Men. So, I believe that the fowl in this parable represents both. First and foremost, unclean spirits, but secondarily, men. And that would be the explanation as to how the kingdom of God is also impacted in this way. In Mark and Luke's accounts, the very same parable is given regarding the kingdom of God, which is the inward, invisible, spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Mind you, you can't even enter the kingdom of God without being born again. Devils don't enter the kingdom of God. So the fowls, in Mark and Luke's account, must represent men and the growth of the church. That even though, even though you have people who are born again in the churches, the church still ends up growing into something it ought not grow into. And why is that? Because even born-again people are still sinners. Save sinners, but still sinners. That can compromise, bring in false doctrine, and so on. Okay? There were true believers, getting back to our pivot point in history with Constantine, when the persecution was lifted via the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, there were true believers who were in hiding, who came out of hiding, and joined Constantine's new church. They did, true believers. And even to this day, as I said, um, they're saved people in the Roman Catholic Church, in churches like the Catholic Church that, even though they may be sound on many things— they, they do not preach and teach the true gospel of Jesus, okay? People get saved, and maybe because their family's always been part of this church, they grew up in that church, they keep going to that church. It's a, it's a social thing. It's a family thing or whatever, okay? But here in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, where the kingdom of heaven is under consideration, and it's the visible, physical, earthly aspect of this kingdom— Absolutely, unclean spirits can come into play. Absolutely. And I believe they do here in Matthew, okay? The perfect fulfillment of this is going to be in the tribulation, obviously. Obviously. The king is still absent, but the true church is gone. All born-again believers are in heaven via the rapture of the church, but in the tribulation you're going to have a one-world religion, an anti-church, if you will, which is represented by that entity in Revelation called Babylon the Great. And she is not just a one-world religion. She is a global political power that brings the Antichrist to power, according to Revelation 17. Okay? So that is the prime and perfect fulfillment of the prophecy of this parable. Okay? So that's the parable of the mustard seed. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to stop there for tonight. Uh, we will pick up on the parable of the leaven next time, okay? 
All right, before we go, we want to give all of you who are listening to us who have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior the opportunity to do just that, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're listening to us and you're a Roman Catholic. Maybe you're a Greek Orthodox. Maybe maybe you're a Baptist. You grew up in the Baptist church. You've heard the gospel all your life. You know it in your head, but you've never truly received Jesus as your personal Savior. It would be a shame to miss heaven by 18 inches because you knew it up here in your head, but never accepted it personally in your heart. Salvation's simple, that a child can be saved. Jesus even said that the, the, the faith that it takes to be saved is that of a little child. It's that of the grain of a mustard seed. It's that small. It's not the amount of faith. It's who your faith is in. And so the Lord's waiting to save you. He wants to save you. He's made the way for you to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you've got to realize that you are truly a lost sinner. Okay? You've got to realize that there's not a thing that you and I can do to save ourselves. The bad news is, is we're all guilty sinners and we're under the penalty of eternal death. You've got to realize that. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, it's not a matter of me being a heinous, habitual sinner. I'm a sinner. Once I've committed one sin, I can be classified as a sinner. In fact, I'm not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. The first sin I ever committed was because I had a sinful heart and a sinful nature right from conception. That's how we come into this world, folks. It's the truth. And because we're all sinners, there's a penalty, and that penalty is death. Romans 6.23, the first part of the verse says, the wages of sin is death. And that death isn't just physical. And that's because sin is not always physical, but it is always spiritual. Even if a person lies with their mouth, murders with their hands, steals with their hands, That lie, that murder, that theft originated in the core of their being, in their very heart. They were committed and accepted that they were going to do this before they ever carried it out. There's even sins that we have committed in our heart that we don't ever get to carry out in our bodies because we're prevented to, but in our heart of hearts, it's as if we've already done it. That's a sin. It's as if we did it. So sin is not always physical, but it is always spiritual. And because of that, there's not just physical death. First and foremost, there is spiritual death, which is separation from God in a place called hell. Revelation 21.8 says, But the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you've got to realize you're lost before you can be saved. There's not a thing you can do that I can do to save ourselves. We can't join any church, get baptized, do this work, do that work, do the best we can. None of that amounts to anything you see because sin makes a mark on our souls that can't be erased. There's only one way to erase it, and that's by the blood of Jesus. And there's only one way the blood of Jesus is applied to your soul. And that is when you put faith and trust in him as your Savior. Not through the waters of baptism, not by joining a specific church, not by engaging in a list of sacraments, rites, or rituals, or commandments, or to-dos, but by simply repenting of your sin, being sorry for your sins, and putting your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. That's it. God made the way for you and me through Jesus. That's the good news. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. And so any and all who receive him by faith are given the gift of eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world, he so loved you, he so loved me, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, you, me, anyone, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, that is, go to hell, 
but have everlasting life, that is, go to heaven. And because Jesus paid for that price, he died spiritually on the cross, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He bore our sins on that cross and took the punishment of an eternal hell for you and me, and then gave up his life physically. Because he did all that and rose again the third day, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave, eternal life is now offered as a free gift to any and all who receive it. The last part of Romans 6.23 says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, it's through him. We don't get it just by showing up. Okay? Jesus died and rose again. That doesn't save you. It makes you, it makes salvation possible. To be saved, you got to come to Jesus and receive him as your Savior. You receive him, he'll receive you. He will not cast you out. He promised in John 6, 37, <clears throat> He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so Acts 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. Just believe on the Lord. Are you willing to do that tonight? Then I'm going to pray a prayer. You pray along with me. It's not the prayer that's going to save you, but what you believe in your heart. But pray after me now and receive Jesus. Dear God in heaven, I admit that I'm a lost sinner, and I deserve to go to hell. I thank you for loving me so much, for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus, to make a way for me to be saved. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much to take my penalty in my place. I believe that you died for all of my sins, and I believe that you rose again the third day. And I believe that you can and you would save me if I asked you. And so the best way I know how, I'm asking you to do just that. I can't remember all my sins, but you know them all. And I ask that you forgive me for each and every one of them. I'm asking you to come into my heart and save my soul. Give me a home in heaven. I'm putting my faith and trust in you to get me to heaven, not in anything I've done, not in anything I'll ever do, but in you and you alone. Transform me from the inside out and help me to live for you. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're saved because the Lord said so. Okay? All right, folks, our time has come and gone. Until next time, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Put on the whole armor of God and be steadfast, unmovable, and always abound in the work of the Lord. We hope you'll be able to join us tomorrow night for Tuesday Night Prophecy. Remember that we love you and we're praying for you. You pray for us. Some people have asked about my wife, Lisa, and if I have an update. We still don't have one, folks. We hope to have it tomorrow night before Tuesday Night Prophecy. So just keep praying for her. Again, we love you and we're praying for you. We'll leave you a little bit more of the hymn of heaven. This is the Swore family as we sign off tonight. Good night, folks. There will be a day